Hi, and welcome to another episode of What Do You Want to Do? This is part one of a series of shows with my friend Brian Moynihan, a member of my long ago after school activity at Swamp Scott High School, The Cable Club. And as you know, I always say it, geniuses come out of the cable club, and Brian certainly is not only not the ex exception, but he's probably one of the leaders of the pack of geniuses that came out of that group of kids. And it's 30 years later, or maybe more, I don't like to think of that, but he has gone on to be vice president of Altisim, and you'll find out what Altisim is right when we start the interview. Let's not wait anymore. Part one of Brian Moynihan's interview. With me now is Brian Moynihan, and he's the VP of Marketing at Altisim. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yep. And this is really exciting to me because I've been trying to do research on AI and what it can do for you and what it can do for the world and what it might do to the world and the future, and it's really exciting stuff. So why don't you tell the audience what you do? What is your title besides what I just mentioned from LinkedIn mm -hmm. and how you got to where you are? Sure, absolutely. First of all, it's a pleasure to be on the show. I have known Len for a long time, and it, um, whether or not you know it, um, you're one of the most influential people in my life. Um, so when, when I was uh, in high school, uh, Len uh, ran the, the uh, cable studio, and that was like the center hub for me and a bunch of my friends who are still my lifelong friends when I still go into, come into town and see them. Uh, I just saw three of them the other day. <laughs> and so it's been, it was a really important part of, of who I became. So um, thank you for, for all you've done, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I live for those words, Brian. It's just very validating, and I thank you for saying it and meaning it. I didn't pay him, folks. <laughs> Whatever you're being paid, it's clearly not enough. That's absolutely <laughs> true. I think that was that's been true probably your your whole career. But I think, you know, maybe there's a um you know, if you look back and uh and this is your life, you know, the what is the, the classic Jimmy Stewart movie, you know. Um and uh I think that's what it's all about. So it's a, your life is a success when you've changed people's lives for the better. So uh, I think on on that uh, score, you definitely. I hope well. so. It's not going to pay for my trip to Europe someday, but uh, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Thank to you. get to your question, so you asked, you know, what what am I doing in my job today, and then you know, what's the path that, that brought me here? Um, so as of uh, two months ago, or a month and a half, I, I am the vice president of marketing at a company called Ultisim. Um, and uh, Altisim is, is pretty awesome. It aligns with a lot of things I've been wanting to do for a long time. So it's a cool, cool combination. So I live in North Carolina. Um, I grew up around the Boston area, lived in Ohio, traveled all over the place, um, but came to uh, North Carolina to go to the university, UNC Chapel Hill, um, and, uh, and never left. It's a nice part of the world, college town, and, and there's good things going on. Um, and so the company I'm working at is local to here and has ties to the university historically, but it works on, on basically three things. Simulation. So we're thinking about like virtual reality and 3D models of things, digital twins, if you know that term, um, AI. And so all the different ways that artificial intelligence can be part of that. Um, and then learning simulations. Um, so really thinking about education and how we use those simulations. So the 3D models, all the AI, and, and use it to, to teach people, um, specifically in, in K-12 adventures um, that people can go on to, you know, like the adventures of Marco Polo or learning math from Pythagoras or going on uh, the Odyssey um, with, you know, with Ulysses. And so there's a lot of cool things that we do um, in the company. So it's been exciting for me to be part of it. And it aligns with a lot of things I've been interested in for a while. This makes me think of, and I have a whole list of questions that I wrote down, which I don't usually do because a lot of this is very technical, but this jumps into my head without even looking. Has any of the things that you do that you're involved with, the 3D stuff and the AI, has it been previewed over at Epcot in Disney? Because usually that would be the first place that the public gets exposed to it. At least it mm -hmm. used to be up until mm -hmm. flat screen TVs were the last thing that I saw there that actually came true. Nowadays, mm -hmm. when I go there, the last time I was there was 
2019 and nothing was new. Mm. So, so ha has anything that you're involved with been featured over there? No, I'm not aware what, of what's going on currently with Epcot, but this is definitely something that's kind of escaped the bounds of, of that. I mean, it's really everywhere. Um, and, um, it, but I love it. It's so, it's really, you know, the, the fusion of the digital world and all that it can bring, all the benefits and, and drawbacks really of the, the digital world with the real world. Um, and I think that actually a, a good model of that, and people are kind of thinking like, you know, uh, I like to say computers started, it was the 1940s, uh, computers were taking uh, wires and plugging it from here to there. And then if it was mm -hmm. the 1970s, you'd be looking at some, you know, blank cards and flipping through them. If it was the 1980s, you'd have like a green screen, you know, and then you got some windows and then we had a touch screen. And, and now we have computers that you can interact with in all kinds of ways, not just virtual reality where you're seeing in 3D, but, you know, using your voice to talk to AI and, um, and you know, various different ways of interacting. Um, and so what's exciting to me is this technology is all coming together and it's coming together with the real world around us. And so the model people have in their head is just like, yeah, even what, what Apple's trying to do is like, hey, you have an iPad, you know that flat screen? Now you can have a really big flat screen in your living room. And I think that Apple's not stupid enough to think that's what the technology's for. They just are trying to take everybody from where they are to where they need to go next. But the metaphor is not, here's another like, you know, iPad in the sky. The metaphor is really what you mentioned. It's, it's um, theme parks. How do we give somebody an experience that, that's like social and they're in it and it's their whole body, their emotions, all the things that you can get from a theme park, and then you bring that in uh, in, in virtual reality. And to me, my favorite model is actually the Boston Museum of Science or lots of the great museums um, everywhere because I really believe that how do we use this technology to make people better? And ed education and healthcare are the two areas I've always worked in. And, um, and for education, think about the Museum of Science. When you go there, and I went there with my my nieces and nephews and uh, and my son, and you know it was like multiple people. And you see this, we saw a lightning show. Um, we were able to see a swirl that was kind of like a, a hurricane. You could stick your hands in it and change the pattern as it swirls. You can have kids sitting up and down on on um, seesaws and seeing the effect when you sit one place over another and learning physics. So it has all of these elements of your whole body, your emotions, other people, you know, the space around you. It's really a space to think in. And I think that's what we're moving towards for education um, and then in all sorts of other areas as well. I agree. It's a well of positivity. I'm going to give you an example of technology that has been problematic. The use of the smartphone has caused a lot of problems in public schools. No one knew what to do with it as far as does it belong in school? Should parents be able to text their kids in school? And it, it's it's an ongoing, no matter what city that I have taught in, it's mm -hmm. been this source of aggravation for teachers. And did you know when a teacher gets observed, the teacher gets in trouble if somebody observing sees a smartphone in front of a student, even if they're not oh, wow. using it. Wow. it that, that's how pervasive this problem is. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that not only with smartphones, but other technology that has come out, nobody seems to think about how to be careful with it, how to prevent mm -hmm. misuse. Um, what do you think about AI and what could be the ramifications of if somebody misuses it? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I think that, you know, the, the there's a name for this and it's been around for a long time called the, it's the dual use problem, right? And so... For instance, if you have a knife, you could use it to chop up your vegetables. A certain type of knife could be used to do surgery, you know, really positive things. Or you could use a knife to stab somebody, right? And uh, so, yeah, and in, in fact, right behind you is, is a very old technology that's just like that fire, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like people, it could be used to, to burn down a forest and, and ruin people's lives and kill people or pay, cause pain. Or it could be used to heat up your food and, and warm people up and, and drive all kinds of positive things as well. So I think this has been around for a long time. Um, and uh, certainly we can't ignore that. Now, I will say that one of the things I think is really positive about these technologies is if you take, you know, the haves and have nots, if you take males and females, if you take, you know, rich and poor, if you take all kinds of sort of distinctions, power distinctions that have been held against people, um, that this technology is more aware of these problems at an earlier stage. That, that I will say that. So I don't think we've overcome the problems completely. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's a, there's a broad awareness of, you know, in AI, is there bias in this training set? 
Um, and and there's you're seeing these crazy things going back and forth. So you might say, what does a CEO look like? And they were like all men and they were all white. Yeah, not all, but like statistically, you know, yeah. uh, too many of them were. And um, and so that, that could be problem problematic if you're a young black girl and you want to become a CEO. You know, you don't see yourself reflected. Um, but then Google came up with one where they would went so far the other way that they would and wouldn't let allow anyone to be white. And so it was like, what do Vikings look like? And it was like it was like a black <laughs> Viking. And it was like that's ridiculous. You know, it's, it's just not accurate. So so but it, but it, we're challenged. We're the fact is like you know, Chat GPT and some of these like image generators have only been around since about 2022. So at the time of this, it's like less than two full years, and. Um, and and yet we're already speeding up through this process as fast as possible to think how we can get through it. And I don't think we're ever going to quite get over it. I think there's always AI is going to cause all kinds of negative problems. It is. Um, I'm already worried about spam, especially for my elderly parents, that somebody could like copy my voice off this video and then call them up and give, you know try to take their money. I mean, like there's all kinds of terrible things that could happen for sure. And so I think we have to be aware of them. And I think that we also have to use those things for good, you know. We already saw President Biden uh, in a an AI generated video, and he didn't make it. And he was telling people not to vote in the primary; only the real election is is uh, important. And obviously, yeah. that was discovered to be fake. Um, you know, that's just some of the stuff. Now, I don't mean to zero in on it. Contrary to that, I I'm very into it myself. I'm really anxious to learn, and you might as well tell me now, where is the best place that I'm not going to be scammed and I can learn how AI can be useful in my life? Hmm. Um, so, for instance, you could probably just ask ChatGPT itself. <laughs> I mean, so I've been, I've been reading a lot about this recently and, and learning, and I'm about to go to a conference where I learn more about how AI, how AI works. And I work with a group of people who've been doing it for decades who are really experienced. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky in that regard. Um, but, you know, some of the things I'm learning is it's a different form of programming. Um, for, for instance, if you want to talk to a computer before, first of all, <laughs> the computer would do something very reliable. This is not reliable at all. It's really more like a human being in that regard. Um, and, you know, you, you ask the same question, you get different answers. You ask a question and sometimes it hallucinates a totally made up thing, which is very dangerous. Uh, my wife is a, a medical librarian. And can you imagine? And it does. It hallucinates medical citations and we saw that in actually trump's some of his lawyers where it, it, they said like well there's all these you know cases that have proven in the past that this is you know uh prior evidence and then it was he got it from chat gpt trump's lawyer straight up had hallucinated made up citations for a legal case um and so there are definitely problems there for sure but i would say if i would give a piece of advice think about it like you're talking to a person um, and so it really, it's about clear communication. It's about clear intent um, and saying, this is what I want from you and give it as much context as you can. So I was giving you an example of a friend of mine and I said like, well, you know, I was talking about Manchester, Massachusetts. And he's like, oh, I know about Manchester. He's from, he's not from Massachusetts. And he said, we did a study with them and we did things like that. And then he's like, but they're not on the ocean. And I was like, yeah, it's like, no, you're thinking about Manchester, New Hampshire. And that's exactly my point. Is that if you if I start saying you know White Mountains and things like that, and I say Manchester, you'll probably think of New Hampshire. If I say Boston, Salem, you'll probably think of Massachusetts. If you say Hartford, you'll think of Connecticut. And if you say soccer, you're probably or football, you're probably going to think of Manchester, UK. So the same word Manchester means so many possible things that you need to give it a little bit of extra context so it can zero in on the right Manchester. And so um, in this case, when you're talking to an AI. You often say, act as a blank, you know, act as a librarian, act as a marketing specialist, act as, a, a, you know, a fiction writer, um, act as a, a, a really good friend, um, and and then draw from these data sources. Um, here's some examples. So you don't just say, give me the blah. You know, you say, here's an example, three good examples of what I want you to answer. And then you take those three examples, and then that your fourth example, you know, generate some fourth after that. And then after that, it's still a conversation, because you're like, oh, it didn't quite understand me. So then you try it a different way in a different way. But it's really more like a conversation. It's more about giving as much con context as possible. Um, and then that'll help you along the way. So through AI, I can actually find out where I can learn more about AI just by asking ChatGPT. 
And I, I, I found one called you.com that I like a lot. Okay. I haven't I tried that one. Have ever heard of that one? No, I don't know that, but then, you know, there's a bunch of, there are open source models of people who are more technical that can download and, you know, so you're not giving your data away to a third party. Um, there are, there's a whole bunch of things. And of course it's being embedded into everything. I mean, it's incredibly useful. Some of this stuff. In fact, I asked this question today. It was like, <laughs> see, I think I have a screenshot of it, but it was like this really long question, uh, like, which I normally wouldn't ask in a search. Um, but it was, um, here it is AI and Bing search. And so I, my question was, why does Windows sometimes add new files to desktop, moving my other icons when I download something to the desktop? <laughs> and it was like, you know, and like normally you wouldn't get a very good answer to that. And I think actually Bing's standard answers weren't that good. But on the sidebar, the chat, the GPT, which is really chat GPT embedded into Bing, looked at that and gave me three answers that were quite good, actually. Um, and so I think that there's there's a sense in which we're we're getting like new features and functionalities and practically everything that's around us. So is your company affiliated with um, OpenAI? Oh, not at all. In fact, you know, we we use uh, OpenAI. We also use Claude. We also which is various yeah. different models. Yeah, and, and, and the open source ones, etc. The reason I tried Claude and I tried U.com was at the time when I was trying to use AI, I read that it wasn't up to date, that they had last updated it in 2021. Now I'm sure it's well beyond that. So U.com kind of became a habit and so did Claude.ai. Sometimes I'll ask both of them or three of them the same question and see what happens. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of fun, you know? This is funny. So uh, the the idea of prognostication or whatever, you know, there's there's this great book that somebody I had one time I asked like somebody, I was going on vacation, tell me a book that like is really interesting, but isn't, you know, most people haven't read. And he said, There's this book called Dice Man. You should read this. And I was like, okay. So I read it. And it's about this guy. And he is like, I guess he's just bored one day and he he has a die, you know, a six sided die. And he's like, um, I don't know, I'm gonna write down six things I'm gonna do. Um, you know, I'll roll the die and whatever it says, I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna do. And he says, well, it wouldn't be interesting, at least unless at least one of these things were something I actually don't want to do. You know, so if I get a six, I'm going to do something with um, the very specific thing that I want to do. So he rolls the die and then he's like, this is great. And he starts feeling confident and he starts doing all this stuff. But then, of course, he gets he ups the ante and he says, like, don't talk to anyone for a month and don't tell anyone why. You know, and so he ends up like losing his wife, losing his job, all these other things. But at the same time, he starts with almost a religion of the dice. So people start following him, his children start getting into it. And then, and uh, anyway, he's just basically living his life by the dice. And I was thinking a lot of people have done this with like astrology or like I'm into Chinese stuff in the I Ching, where you can sort of like prognosticate and get a sense of what you should do next in your life. And I've been thinking actually about doing that with GPT, <laughs> with, with chat, with AI, because I think actually it would give you excellent advice. I think the main and even basic advice is mo what most people need. Like, don't spend more than you earn. You know, get enough right. sleep, <laughs> exercise, don't smoke, don't drink too much. You know, like these super basic advice, and no one can do it. So, and and uh, so, I think that actually uh, it would be a really fun experiment to live your life just taking whatever the 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 uh, AI told you to do, and almost definitely people's results would be better. I think, <laughs> you know, better than the dice man. Anyway, right. So instead of the eight ball, you have uh, the AI ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for so, those who are out there, if you have ChatGPT four, I created a GPT that is based on the Eijing. So it takes the Eijing is the famous book of changes. Yeah, well, I know all about it from the show Dark Shadows. They used to make a thing out of a oh. out of it like a supernatural thing. And the vampire Barnabas Collins would travel back in time using the Eijing and oh wow, interesting crazy stuff like that. You know, yeah. so I. I I'm very curious about your mixing of the I Ching with AI. So I just created, and basically they have these things called GPTs that you can create on there. And it's basically a prompt that becomes its own app. Like, and so you just go there and all I, it was a very simple prompt. And I just said to it, basically, um, I want you to, you ask somebody like what's going on in their life. Normally people are like, you know, the tarot or something. They just kind of randomly tell you some, something. But in my case, I said, tell me what's going on in your life, some problem you're going through. And then I want you to look through the 64 hexagrams and pick the one that's most relevant to that person and then pull in the ancient advice. So this was advice, like the I Ching 
people don't know this, but it, it is like the backbone of Chinese religion and philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, it's older than Confucius. He was he was older than Taoism. They were learning from that stuff. It has like like three thousand years of history of people's good advice piled into this. Um, and so it's actually legitimately good advice, whether or not you believe it magically could predict the future or whatever. And so I asked some questions about that, like, you know, what should I do about this work situation? Um, you know, I don't get to see my cat often enough. What should I do? <laughs> and it, it's been good, actually. The answers are quite good. You should try it. That's, yeah, you have to get the premium version, though, I believe, of mm -hmm. GPT-4 uh, or something. Yeah, it is the premium. That's true, yeah. unfortunately. But it's free after that. Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, before all this AI stuff, we're ninety percent dominating the conversation with AI. What were you into, like before November of twenty twenty two? What was the cutting edge thing? And did you predict the rise of AI before it was announced? I was into VR uh, mostly, so virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, I still, you know, AI was a long time in coming, and I have been actually following that for some time. Um, books like the the, um, the Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos has this idea of like five different schools of AI, and it goes back through it. You know, so I've been reading that stuff for some time. Um, but I think more more importantly is if you go all the way back. I mean, if you remember from high school, I had basically no interest in technology whatsoever. I was not a computer guy, and then um, when I went to college. Um, I started in 1993. I had one of the first email addresses that, that some people had because uh, I got it as a freshman. Um, and this was 1993 was before the World Wide Web. Yeah. Um, so we were on moos and muds and, you know, there were no graphics and no one had ever heard of a browser before. Um, and my friends, some of them hopped on that train and were like quit school, moved to San Francisco and were making $120,000 a year and 1993 is a college dropout it just because anybody could draw you know type some html which you could literally learn in one day um could make tons of money back then and, and so and at that time i was like ah it's all hype i'm not into that stuff what i was into and what i'm still into is buddhism um so um and so my my path really was more like religion and philosophy humanities um and then i spent you know i I got a degree in interdisciplinary studies, which is a combination of all the disciplines put together, which very much fits my personality. But it also gave me the freedom to do sort of whatever I wanted. And what I wanted to do was study about American Zen. And so that's what I did. I took classes in philosophy and, you know, wrote a thesis on it. Um, I spent a year overseas in, in uh, Taiwan teaching English, came back and got a master's degree in Buddhism. Um, and then I was like, you know, I've gone far enough towards my sort of I was a vertical and horizontal growth. I, I think that vertical growth is like get a job, make money, you know, get married, buy a house, you know, all the things, you know, retire and die. <laughs> and, and horizontal growth is like, try this, try that, and explore, you know, and go to different countries and have different kinds of jobs and different experiences and stuff. So after my, uh, I got a master's degree at around age 24, I spent the next six years just messing around, like being a bohemian, traveling from place to place. I had one, one year I had 15, 15 different kinds of jobs. <laughs> That's amazing. All, I love that. <laughs> I, I wish I did that. Countries. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and it was only then I was turning 30 and I was like, oh man, I need to get serious. And so I said, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to get a PhD. I'm going to buy a house and, you know, meet a nice girl. I guess not the job because I was getting a PhD, uh, but I was like, moving on a career path. And I did all those things. So in 2005, moved to here, bought a house, met a girl, started a PhD path, um, and uh, and and tried to grow up a little bit. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure how successful I've been in the growing up process. But <laughs> growing up is overrated, Brian. <laughs> I never um, but, grew up. <laughs> so for me, I didn't I didn't actually do any technology until I was like so after two years of of uh, working on a, a PhD and, and that this you know, for all your passions, I was interested in learning and uh, exploring different cultures and teaching and, and talking to people about this stuff, you know, reading and writing and all those things are like perfect for, for an academic. And so I'm an academic, I can't leave the university. I, you know, I'm just, I'm in a college town. I love it, but it's a terrible job. You go super into debt. You make almost no money. It's shameful how little people with PhDs make. I know and I've tried teaching college before. Oh, and it's it's rough. I mean, the good thing compared to what you're talking about, though, is 
And originally I was like, I wanted to go into education. And my father's like, you'd be terrible at like a high school or something like that. And he was right because, and you know, this, like, you, like you were saying, you spend more time, you think I'm going to be his teacher. I have this great idea. I love my, you know, I love the, the, the thoughts I'm going to have and the people I'm going to teach and, and they're going to learn awesome stuff. And then you spend all your time babysitting. <laughs> Where at least in college, you're not babysitting as much, right? It's like, it's more about trying to convey, educate, you know, stuff and, and go with them. But it's still a rough job. Getting back to the, what the very beginning of the show was, you were talking about our cable club, which I mention frequently on the show. Most of the guests that I've had on the show have been from the cable club. Yeah. Why? Because the cable club people were, you all had a commonality that you were always explorers, creative, not a, a, a linear path, um, it, just experimental, just very exciting and mature for your ages. And you, we would try anything. We had a comedy show that we did that, that, you know, that was so, that was like the most fun I ever had in, in, in my career. And, um, so back then, do you remember a kid named, uh, Evan Rosenthal? Uh, Rosenfields, maybe Rosenfield. Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. it's been so long. Yeah. He used to bring computers into the control room and he'd leave it set up on the table. And he said, I'm going to teach you how to use a computer. And everything that he said, virtually everything he said went in one ear and went out the other. It was all DOS. And just it looked like just gibberish going up and down the screen. I could not imagine what you could do with that that would be beneficial. Why yeah. do people need computers? It, you know what I mean? It, it, it's it's mind-boggling because since then, my whole career has been based on a Mac. I had to learn how to edit all over again when Joe Dulette, hi, another guest on this show, Joe Dulette, uh hired me at summer camp and taught me Adobe Premiere. And it took me about 10 years to become as good, I thought, as I was in the old pre-nonlinear editing thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's a lot of that Thinking back to my great grandparents, they were eight. They were nineteenth century people. They mm -hmm. had a TV. They didn't even know what to do with it. Okay, mm -hmm. they could use the telephone. They listened to the radio. So the analogy is, there are a lot of people right now who, especially when they're older, and I consider myself older at this point, unfortunately, um, that don't know what to do, where to go with this stuff. And how can they use it in their lives? So it well, seems your, like you need a school to 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 explore all the aspects of of the potentialities of this stuff. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, there's um, I've gone my own way, but I'm not sure what I would suggest to somebody who's not me. And so it's a little hard to say. But I know that, like, for instance, Khan Academy is a place that has always been ahead. of. The, it's totally free ahead of the curve in like every single possible way. And so many people out of there, they've do so many innovative things. What's so the I name again? Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, Khan oh, Academy. Where are they? And um, I mean, he, Salman Khan, the guy who started that, I mean, if you've heard of a flipped classroom model, for instance, where you, you uh, watch the videos at home and then you use the in-class time for the most valuable part of it, which is the interaction between the teacher and the, and the students. Um, he basically came up with that model. He's a genius and a ton of people who work there have come up with a lot of great stuff as well that I've been following for years. Um, so Khan Academy is an excellent one. And he actually was the first one to, to incorporate an AI chatbot that is personalized to the student and for the teacher. And to, to, to and that was part one of my interview with Brian Moynihan. A lot to digest, I know. So as I'm going to do, even after I edit this show, because there's another part or two left over, I'm going to watch it again and again, even after I edit, because there's so much that we talked about. So join us next time. And until then, what do you want to do?